Bibles this morning to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. We continue this morning in our study of this important letter tucked away near the end of the New Testament. The Apostle Peter is the human author. He's writing to persecuted churches that have been scattered throughout Asia Minor. If you recall when we introduced this letter, I mentioned to you that 1 Peter was dealing with persecution that was coming from the outside. Well, this is a different kind of persecution in 2 Peter. This is persecution from the inside. Uh, These are those who are coming within their midst and bringing false teaching and false Uh, false teachers with false teaching, false apostles um, coming and infiltrating the church with things that go against the truth. Persecution is interesting. You would have thought after 2,000 years, persecution would have wiped out the church because I'm amazed at how the church went through so much persecution. You read it in the Bible, but you also read it in, in church history. And you see that the fact the church still remains after 2,000 years, even true with the, na- excuse me, with the nation Israel, all the evil, all the, all the opposition, all the enemies that the church has had from without and from within, and it still stands. Because Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overpower it or destroy it. And the means that God has used throughout the 2,000 years of church history especially has been the preaching of the Word of God, the preaching of truth. It's always interesting to me that when you read about in the last times, Timothy, you're going to see all these terrible things happening. Men will be lovers of self. Uh, they'll, they will hate the truth. They will attack you. They will go after you. He says, but here's what you're supposed to do. You are to preach the Word. You preach the truth, and you don't stop doing that. It's the power of God. It's the, it's the, the weapon, the sword of the Spirit that God uses to confront these uh, the, who oppose the plan of God and the church of God. And so it's the preaching of the Word of God, and that's what our passage is about Uh, or at least this letter is about, and it's reminding them of that truth, reminding them of God's Word and what God's Word says. If you're going to confront these uh, false teachers that are going to infiltrate you, you've got to be so aware of the truth of what's right that error just stands out. You can tell the false immediately because you're so familiar with the truth. You know it so well. You're so saturated with it that error just doesn't fit. It just doesn't fit. You know something is wrong with what you are hearing. And I believe that's exactly what the approach is in this letter. He's got false teachers in chapter 2, and he's got doctrine on both sides of chapter 2, 1 and 3. And basically, that's how you confront the problem, is with truth. And he's going to remind them. It's a ministry of reminding you read, you saw that. You saw that in verse 12. We're in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. Ready to remind you. You see that in verse 15. You'll be able to recall these things and be able to uh, bring them to mind. I'm going to remind you of things. Verse 13, I forgot that one. To stir you up by way of reminder. This is about the reminding ministry of the Apostle Peter. And thus it's our ministry as well, a reminding ministry. I'm not really got you here this morning to tell you something new. If I start saying something new, you you better get concerned. Because it's just week after week reminding you. Saying it in different ways, yes, but reminding you so that you know When error comes, you know what it looks like because you know the truth so well. And that's what he's doing here, and that's what he says here. I want you to be able to recall these things. When things get really tough and I'm gone, 
Because that's the context. He sees his, the end of his life coming. His, his, his exodus is near. His leaving this world is near. And I want you to be able to recall to mind some things when it really gets difficult. Things that will sustain you. And so you see the heart of Peter here in this section. You get a glimpse into his heart. You get a glimpse into his ministry and how he sees his ministry. Reminding you of these things as you might recall them after I'm gone. I want to stir you up. I want to agitate you. That's stir up. And so, I want you to, he says, I know you're established in these things. I know these are things that you, you know and you're established in them. But doesn't mean Peter gets all novel and creative and say, okay, well, let me find the latest thing and talk about that, the latest philosophy that appeals and tickles people's ears, and let me talk about that. He doesn't say that. He doesn't do that. He just goes back to, this is the truth. I remind you of this. And you know why? Do you know why we have to be reminded so much? Is because we forget so easily. We are expert forgetters. I hate to think what the percentage is of people that will, after all I did for this sermon this week, how many of you walk out here today and forget most of what I said? But that's true. That's a reality. I'm the same way. I'm not faulting you. That is just how we are wired. We're so distracted by other things. Or other th- and there may be a few things I can recall, but then and sometimes people ask me a question about something I said last week. I have to go look it up. It's just how we are. We're just expert forgetters. Now, some things stick out more than others. I get it because, oh, well, that really applies at this moment or something. Let me just show you something interesting about some reasons why this is important. Go to Exodus 17. Exodus 17. In Exodus, the people are becoming more and more antagonistic towards Moses' leadership. He has brought them into the wilderness. And... It's almost like they can't get their mind off of what they had back in Egypt. When you look, I've, I've been in the wilderness out there in, in the Sinai, and I, can, I get it. That's very desolate. I would, I would complain a lot, too. But Moses, you brought us out here to die. Moses, we don't have any water. Moses, are you, you're not, you can't be called of God to be doing this. You couldn't. What have you done? Verse 3, but the people thirsted for water and they grumbled against Moses and said, why now have you brought us from Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Did you forget about the bricks you had to build? Did you forget about that? Did you forget about the oppressive taskmasters of, of Egypt? Did you forget about that? Actually, that seems more appealing than the wilderness. Verse 4, so Moses cried to the Lord saying, what shall I do to this people a little more and they will kill me, they will stone me. Verse 5, then the Lord said to Moses, pass before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand your staff with which you struck, struck the Nile and go. And behold, he goes and he strikes it and, and water comes out and he provides it. And he named the place Massa and Meribah because of a quarrel get this, because of the quarrel of the sons of Israel and because they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? Can you imagine what they have been through to get to this part? Do you remember the Red Sea? Do you remember Pharaoh's armies approaching and the sea parting? Do you remember that? It's all the other miracles of provision. It's almost like they forgot. They forgot how God rose up a nation and brought them out in Exodus. Go to verse, next verse actually, verse 8. Then Amalek, 
came and fought against the Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, choose men for us and go out and fight against Amalek. Tomorrow I will station myself on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. Joshua did as Moses told him and fought against Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and Ur went up to the top of the hill. And so it came about when Moses held his hand up that Israel prevailed. When he let it down, Amalek prevailed. As his hand got heavy, somebody had to come and hold his hand up. And you know how the story goes. So Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, get this, write this in a book as a memorial and recite it to, the, to Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And so Moses then builds an, alt, uh, an altar and names it, the Lord is my banner, the Lord is my standard. They needed a memorial. They needed a reminder, a reminder of God's faithfulness in delivering them and, and fighting a battle for them. They, they needed some reminder, so they have this altar. It's associated now with worship. It's memorialized a truth about God, that God is faithful. And this is important for Joshua because Joshua is going to take over soon and he's going to have to have something in those trying moments to go back to and remind himself of the faithfulness of God. So write it down, Joshua. Get it written down so you'll have that. Now turn to Joshua chapter 4. The book of Joshua is immediately after the day's that Moses had died, and Joshua now takes over, and he is going to be the one that is going to take the Israelites into the promised land. And so you're standing now with this, the nation of Israel at the overflowing banks of the Jordan River, which is significant because that's the time of year it was, spring, but it's also significant to the fact now that we are back to something that we began with. We began with the Red Sea parting. Now we're about to see the overflowing banks of the Jordan parting. God's going to do wonders just like he did 41 years earlier. He's going to cause the water to rise up into this big heap, and they're going to walk through dry land. You see it, verse 17. And the priest, verse, uh, first th chapter 3, verse 17, last verse of chapter 3. And the priest who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan while all Israel crossed on dry ground until all the nation had finished crossing the Jordan. There you go. This is how we started, and this is how we got there oh, at the end when we go into the promised land. Go down to verse 1 of chapter 4. Now when all the nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord spoke to Joshua saying, Take for yourselves twelve men from the people, one man from each tribe. Take up for yourself twelve stones, put them in the middle of the Jordan, and from the place where the priest's feet are standing, carry them over there and lay them down in the, in the lodging place where you will lodge tonight. So Joshua did that, uh, each from each tribe. He said, cross again to the ark of the Lord, your, verse 5, your God, into the middle of the Jordan, and they took the stones. Let this notice be a sign among you so that when your children ask later, saying, what do these stones mean? What do these stones mean? You'll be able to tell them. You'll be able to remind them of the faithfulness of their God. Go, to chat, go down to verse 21 of chapter 4. He said to the sons of Israel, When your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What are these stones? And you shall inform your children, saying, Israel crossed this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan before you until he had crossed, just as the Lord your God had done the Red Sea, when he's dried up before us all we had crossed until we all had crossed, but all the peoples of the earth may know. Well, listen, this is important. All the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the, the Lord is mighty, so that you may fear the Lord your God forever. This, this is going to tell the other nations around you that your God is a true God, a faithful God, a powerful God. This memorial will do that. This memorial will point to that as a reminder that he did that. Because you know what? You're going to forget his goodness. They're always warned that. I don't know. I read it this morning in Hosea even. But you're reading it and it's like you're even reminded that they, when you get into land, you're going to forget. When you get in prosperity, you're going to forget. When you get in trials and tribulations, you're going to forget. 
you need to be reminded that God is faithful. His past acts, his past acts sustained his people that they might live. In his commentary, it's interesting, I was reading John MacArthur's commentary this past week, and it's interesting, he's talking about, in this particular passage, he's talking about the Holocaust Memorial. I've been to the one in Washington, D.C., and I have been in the one in Jerusalem, the Holocaust Memorial, which you go into, and you see all the horrors of Nazism inflicted on the Jewish nation, you see the horrors of the concentration camps, you see children, you see abuses of all kinds. As you're walking through there, I mean, you're just, you're just solemn. Nobody's talking as you're going through these museums. It's just the horrors of it all, the fear in people's faces and the many pictures they have throughout the place and all the children. It's so sad, it's so sad. And when you exit that place, there's a big sign that says, Remember, remember, we don't want to do this again. It's a reminder. But you know what he points out in this commentary, which I thought was interesting? He points out, he says, the Jews need to remember something even more important than that. Go to Deuteronomy 6. This is what... Israel really needs to remember and be reminded of. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, you're familiar with this verse. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Those words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit down in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Then it shall come about when the Lord your God brings you into the land which he swore to your fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you the great and splendid cities which you, which you did not build and full, your houses are full of good things and olive trees and all these vineyards and things like that. Verse 12, then watch yourself that you do not forget, that you do not forget secular Israel today just like we need to do even as Christians is not forget the Lord who brought, us, brought you from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. You shall not fear only the Lord your God. Excuse me. You shall fear only the Lord your God, and you shall worship him and swear by his name. You shall not follow other gods, any of the gods of the peoples who surround you. Your children forgot because the parents forgot. And then pass it on. And you had a secular nation when it was all over. God is your redeemer. That's what they need to remember. That's what I need to remember, and you need to remember. God is my redeemer. Because I need to be redeemed. He and He alone is to be worshipped, not my idols, not all my self, selfish things and desires needs to be worshipped. Go back to Second Peter. So Peter understands the necessity of reminding. He, he learned it from Jesus. Communion. What is communion? Remembrance. I don't know if it's written on the front of our table or not. Can y'all see it? Is it written there? <laughs> there see? It's just I haven't, couldn't remember. <laughs> I couldn't remember if it was there. But the point is, why do we do communion? Who likes to think about a death? <laughs> I, I try not to think about that too much. He said, I don't want you to forget about this death, because this death matters. A lot of people die. A lot of people get crucified on crosses throughout history. But not every death is like this death. Remember, because you'll forget. You'll forget.
You're like me. You just get busy and distracted. And you'll watch too much TV and read too many books that are written by secular authors and all of that kind of stuff, and you'll let your mind get filled with so many other things that it'll just cloud out these truths, and you'll need to be brought back once again to, rem- to remember and to re- be reminded. John 14, 26, you don't need to turn there. You don't need to turn there. But this is the disciples after three years with Jesus. He says this, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I said to you. Because I know even after three years, you cannot remember it all. We have an incredible ability to forget, folks. even those things that we have known. Peter gives us some things here. Let me take the, uh, the key words in some of these verses and they'll be my outline. Let's do the word ready. Let's do the word ready in verse 12. The word ready, therefore I will always be ready to remind you of these things. These things in the ESV, I think, says these qualities. Keep in mind, we've just talked about. We've just talked about salvation. We've just talked about sanctification. We've just talked about these qualities that you're to add to your faith. We've just talked about all of that in verses 1 through 11. So the therefore points us back to all of that. He says, I want to remind you of these things, these qualities. I know, you're, I know you are, what does he say there? You're established in them. I know you already know them but I'm reminding you of them. I'm always be ready to do that because when you say I'm ready to do something, it implies that there has something there already for you to be ready to do that for. That just may not make any sense what I just said, but you get the idea that you're to be ready because something has already been said beforehand. This is not new. And so let's just take the first one, the nature of salvation. Let me say this to you one more time. The nature of salvation, just like the Jews in the Old Testament, we need to be reminded that it's the mighty hand of God that was mighty in our salvation. The gospel is not just for unbelievers to hear. We as believers need to hear this over and over again, that God is the one that did this. God is the one that called us out. God is the one that chose us before the foundation of the world. In fact, you see it, you see it in verse uh, 1. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ to those who have received. See that? Received. I just say it again. Saving faith comes from God. You, the best you can do yourself is muster up some kind of human faith, some kind of human belief, some kind of unsaving faith. Here today and gone tomorrow. But that's not saving faith. And you got this by his sovereign will. You did nothing to earn that. It is totally by grace that he gave that to you. Apart from your works, apart from your efforts, for by grace you have been saved through faith. No one can boast about it. It's a gift of God. The faith and the grace that is all included in the it. It's a gift gift of God, came by the mighty hand of God. Martin Luther said this, he goes, you need to be reminded that it's faith alone, yes, but, it's, but faith itself is not alone. Our faith, in his words, is a prepackaged faith, prepackaged faith. Look at verse 3. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. He has created us in Christ Jesus. Why? That we could perform good works that he has established beforehand. Then that brings us to the nature of sanctification. This is something else. They learned the nature of salvation. This is, I'm reminding you of that, he says. I remind you of these things. Now I remind you of the nature of sanctification. You see that beginning in verse 5. Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, to this God-given faith, to this saving faith, you, your part, supply. 
and he gives five virtues or seven virtues that you're to supply. We spent much time in those in previous weeks. Don't forget what I told you. Progressive, lifelong process here. Progressive sanctification. Progressively being set apart. Yes, I have been set apart. That's the past tense of salvation. That's the past tense sanctification. I've been set apart. But this is the progressive sanctification, that process of being set apart. As God's people, own people, zealous for good works, zealous for good deeds. To be conformed to the image of Christ. God wants to make you like his son, and you have a diligent participation in that process. And you go down to verse 8, and you see why this is so important. You see what you have the option here. You have some options. In verse 8, he says this, If these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you have these virtues and they're increasing, if you're adding those by the, the grace of God working in you and you're, able, and you're continually adding these things, you're seeing them increase, he says, they make you useful and fruitful. And verse 10 says, be all the more diligent, go down to verse 10, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. As long as you practice these things, you will never stagger. You will never stumble. You will never lack confidence. We talked about the assurance of salvation last week, right? Assurance is sort of the subjective side of, of salvation. It's I feel saved. There's a concrete, objective truth of the perseverance of the saints that's true of every true believer. And sometimes every true believer, some true believers lack assurance. And it could be because they're not participating in the supplementing of their faith with these virtues. One of the greatest evidences that you belong to Christ is when you see fruit in your life. And you won't stagger and you won't doubt. It helps with that. The other option is verse 9. And this is a danger. He who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, meaning he is uh, nearsighted. He, he can't see. He doesn't have a vision. He doesn't have a spiritual vision. He, he lacks an understanding if he really belongs to God or not because he sees no change. He sees no change. And he will stumble and he will stagger. So you're helping somebody who's struggling with assurance of salvation say, you know what? I can't, I can't help you with your feelings necessarily, but I can at least tell you this. Pursue these virtues. Pursue these virtues with all your might. And trust God that he will give you the certainty that Peter says in verse 10. It's not that I'm working for anything here. I'm just simply giving evidence to the fact that I'm already saved, giving evidence to the fact that I have saving faith. Then I, one more that he's going to touch on, and I will get to this after the first of the year, is the nature of Scripture, because false teachers go after Scripture all the time. We're always having to remind ourselves that this is God's Word, that God breathed it, that God wrote it. Notice in, um, it, that it's sufficient, that it has authority, it's inerrant, all those things. Go down to verse 19. 2 Peter 1:19. He's got some context here I'm not going to take the time to look at, but in 2 Peter 1.19, he says this, So we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, so no, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit from God." And so those are, the, those, are the verse, those are the things of verse 12. 
remind you of these things. For your own assurance, for your dealing with the false teachers out there, he says, these are things I remind you of. Those are pretty much the ones that get attacked the most. Those are pretty much the ones that will come, they will come after. The cults will come after these things. The nature of salvation, the nature of sanctification, and the nature of Scripture. And if you are not solid on them, they will try to sway you away from these things. Peter wants to give you something to plant your feet into. He doesn't spend a lot of time telling you, well, the Gnostics teach this, and the Mormons teach that, and the Jehovah Witnesses teach that. He doesn't spend a lot of time in their doctrines. He spends most of his time in truth so that you, knowing it and establishing it, can recognize error because you're so familiar with it and saturated with it. Go back to verse 12 of 1 Peter. 2 Peter. Don't go to 1 Peter. Don't go to 1 Peter. 2 Peter. Even though you have already know them and have been established in the truth, see that in verse 12, which is present with you. And like I said before, I don't say a lot of new things up here, new teachings. You don't want that. You don't come to this church because you want to hear the newest thing. You, you come here, you want to hear God's word. You don't want to hear something I've imagined up. You don't want to hear something I speculate about. But I'm not taught you anything or teaching you anything that you have not heard. And like Peter, I don't want to become creative or novel. I do not want to rewrite the book. Do not want to entertain or tickle people's ears. That's not what we do. We try to think of different ways to say things. I especially think about Christmas. Next Sunday, I have to do a Christmas sermon. That will be over 30 Christmas sermons I have preached in this church. I'm still trying to think of how to make it sound different without rewriting the story. But I can't. I just... So next week, I expect you to say, thank you for reminding us of these things. <laughs> but this is a timeless truth. I don't make it relevant. It's relevant. We don't make it relevant. People try to do that. They try to do that. They try to do proof texting. They try to come up with an idea and go find a verse that supports that idea. Or go find a verse that has that word in it. They love that one. They find a word they really like in, they, in their new idea, and they go find a verse that has that word, and that's their verse. That's their key verse. They just murder the scripture when they do that. We don't need to make it relevant. It's timeless, always relevant truth. It is, you know, there's, there's truth that is true for this time period because that's the information that people had. And I'm not saying that we don't learn new things as time has gone on in interpretation and, and things like that and, and historical context of things. I'm not saying we don't learn those things, but the point is we don't have new truth. We have timeless truth because we have a timeless God, an eternal God, and he's always been a God of truth. He is not a God that's becoming more truthful. He's a God that is true. It's timeless there was a study done, I, read, I heard another pastor say this, I thought it was very interesting. There was a study done recently, a paid for study that was done, that came to this conclusion when the study was done, that material things do not satisfy people. How much did that cost? Material things do not satisfy people. I'm thinking if they had just studied the book, there's a whole book in the Bible this says the very same thing. Ecclesiastes, the richest man that ever lived, had everything. And what does he say? Vanity of vanities. It's all empty. Not satisfied. That was free. <laughs> it was free. Nothing under the sun can satisfy the human heart. We try to make things under the sun satisfy the human heart. And maybe that's what this Christmas is about to you. The material things, they won't satisfy the human heart. You can pile it on. You'll never have as much as Solomon. He had it all and he was not satisfied. 
This truth is consequential. Understand this. This truth that you've been established in, it matters. It really matters. It's not, it's not just good ideas. It matters. It's life and death and hell. We teach things in this book, and we believe things that matter in life and death. In heaven and hell. And yet I, I get so frustrated with just trivial things, trivial, some trivial Christmas songs lately on the radio. I just go, ah, trivial. We are weighty. We have weighty issues. Weighty issues. That we are to remind each other of. We go through difficult trials and problems and frustrations of life, and I don't need some ridiculous jingle. It does nothing for me. It is vital to remind us of these things because we do get lazy. We all fight slothfulness. We all fight it. We, we so quickly go back into our old thinking. We so quickly go back into our old way of doing things. So we need reminders. I need to be brought out of that. So I know people have left sermons before and said, well, thanks for telling me all that. I've heard it before. <laughs> Should be saying, oh, I am so thankful to hear that truth again because I know how forgetful I am. And I guarantee you, myself included, there's not any of us in this room who lives out well, all we think, everything that we know. <laughs> right? I do not live out everything I know. My goodness gracious. I try. It doesn't always come out right. And that's the same with you. It's not God's fault. I'm a listener. I'm just one of those kind of, I'm a dull listener. You start getting to something that's a little too close to the heart, I kind of shut that down. Tell me something I want to hear. So, next Sunday, I expect you to have, thank you for reminding me of that. Okay, the next verse, 13. No, oh, this is not going as planned here. Second Peter 1, 13. I consider it right. My next word is right. I consider it right as long as I'm in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder. Second Peter 1, 13. Uh, he says, this is just. This is what God requires. It pleases God. Old Testament, New Testament, same principle. It's a righteous principle. Reminding is a righteous principle. Because it's, it's a means to an end. I remind you these things because I have an end in view. I remind myself of these things because I have an end in view. I remind others of these things because I have an end in view. To, to uh, stir you up, see it? To stir you up by way of reminder, to arouse you from your sleep, to be vigilant. To, you're, we get drowsy. We, we fall into, like I said earlier, spiritual laziness. He wants us to have zeal. It's not that I just hear a truth once or know a truth once. It's not I have to hear it over and over and over again. And that's sometimes how illumination works in our hearts. I've said things for years and somebody will come up to me, same thing for years, and, and finally someone will come to me and say, I had never heard that before. And I know good and well I've said it. And you've said it. It's just the seasons of life people are in sometimes. There's times when I've heard something and it didn't register too much and then I heard it again, I go, oh my goodness. That's what that's talking about. Turn over to James 1. Hold your hand in 2 Peter. We'll be right back. We're gonna, we're gonna do this. 2 Peter chapter 1, this is in James. We're in James right now, James 1. Uh, he says in verse 18 of James 1,
in the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. That's good advice right there for all of us. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness and humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. But prove yourselves, notice verse 22, to be doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. If for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror, the mirror being the word of God, for once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. That's, that's a lot of us. We hear it over and over again and we don't apply it. And that's what J Peter's trying to say. He remind you this is what you're supposed to do. Remind you, you need to apply these things. I know you've heard them. I know you've heard them. Notice the time limitation, verse 14, that Peter's under. Knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent. Isn't that interesting? My earthly dwelling. This is your earthly dwelling. Look at, look at yourself. That's you. That, that's your body. That is your earthly dwelling. That's your earthly tent. That is what the real you lives inside of. This is interesting to me how he, he talks like this about death. My, my earthly dwelling. I, I'm going to lay the earthly dwelling aside. I'm going to lay this tent aside. It's, it's happening soon. Man has two parts. Man has a body, he has a soul. He has an inner man, he has an outer man. The inner man is the immaterial part of you. The outer man is the material part of you. We will one day leave these bodies. Our spirit will go into the presence of Christ. And one day there will be a resurrection and a new body will rise and we will be joined to that new body. That's for another day, but that's what happens in death. People that have died are in the presence of Christ in spirit. One day they'll have a new body, a new body that's outfitted for the kingdom. The thief on the cross, from this day forth you'll be with me in paradise. That meant your body is going to stay here and be crucified and die, but you're going to leave this body and you're going to be with me in the presence of Christ, of God. Paradise. Now, I don't know if, if, um, if Peter knew by a special revelation, a recent special revelation, that he was going to be dying soon. That's what he seems to indicate here. I'm not sure if it's a, a new revelation or if it's the one he got 30, 40 years ago when Jesus in John 21 told him this. You can just listen to this. Truly, I truly, I say to you, Peter, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wish. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. He said this signifying by what kind of death would glorify God? Crucifixion. You're going to die by crucifixion one day. Peter, seeing, Peter is sitting in jail right now in Rome, and most likely he's sensing it's getting closer and closer because Nero's persecution is picking up. So he's got, I'm sure that's on his mind, I'm going to go soon. That's possibly, he remembers this. He would have been crucified because he was not a Roman citizen. Paul was also probably executed Close to this time, he would have been beheaded because he was a Roman citizen. So that's the horror that waited him. But notice how he talks about it. I'm just going to lay this tent aside. <laughs> this, this, is a, this is a refreshing section to me here. I don't know why, because we live in such a culture that is so obsessed with death. Movie stars and politicians and everybody, the way they talk about death. There's nothing pleasant at all about the process, and for sure. And, and I want to, but you want to have the right attitude about it. It, it means I'm going to lay aside one day this fragile, sinful tent I live in. Hebrews says you don't want to live in fear of death. You don't want to be subject to slavery your whole life by, because you fear death. And everybody hates the thought of growing older. 
and everybody is trying to do everything they can to keep it from happening, and exercising, and diets, and aging, anti-aging creams, and all of those things. And the, hey, I'm not knocking all that, but the point is, I'm just saying, you're going to lose that battle in the end. The outer man is decaying. The outer man is decaying. You can make it look a little better for a while and dress it up however you want to, but the point is, the outer man is decaying. And one day you will lay that material part of you aside. So this is kind of a fresh breath of fresh air. Oh, oh death, where is your sting, Paul says. Oh, death, where is your curse? He's thankful to Christ. He's thankful to God. He's saying, death doesn't hold that kind of power over me. And then he goes and ends 1 Corinthians 15 by saying, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Don't sit around dwelling on that. We certainly should take wise precautions. We certainly should take care of those who are sick and, and all of those things, people who are dying. And the question is not if we're going to, it's appointed a man wants to die, we're all going to die. The question is, are you ready to die? That is the issue. Are you ready to die? Are you ready to die? I ask this at every single funeral I preach. Are you ready to die? Because you don't know the moment, the hour, when God will call you out of your earthly tent. And you better, you want to know that you're going to wake up in the presence of Christ and not in the eternal hell. I could go on to read to you some more history about Peter. I think his death, uh, Clement of Rome says he was crucified uh, at the end of the first, toward the end of the first century. He uh, was most likely crucified upside down. My time is limited. Our time is limited. One Puritan wrote this. I, I, I want to say it's, I can't remember his name, John somebody. I preach as to never preach again as a dying man to dying men. I love that. I think it's the guy that wrote Amazing Grace. Anyway. Okay, let me get one more word in here in three minutes. Go to verse 15. See the word diligent? I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure you will be able to call these things to mind. I'm going to be diligent. I'm going to be rigorous. I'm going to bend every effort I have as long as I am with you, as long as I'm still in this earthly body. This is not a game to me. This is I'm devoted to this. I'm going to lead you. I'm going to remind you so that when I'm gone and things are tough, and the persecution is running wild, and all those things are happening, you'll be able, notice he says in that verse, be able to call these things to mind. That's what you want. That's what I want. You think of yourself as a, as a father. Boy, that's what you want. You think of leaving your kids money and material things? Nope, nope. They don't, that might be nice. I'm not saying it's bad. I said what they need is they need something they can plant their feet in because life is going to get hard. It's going to get hard for them. You want your kids to have something of eternal value. You want your kids and whoever, whoever you have a reminding ministry opportunity towards. And you're, as you approach death and you think about your life and the legacy you want to leave, make sure it's not just trivial matters, not just this pithy sayings. Some philosopher wrote and just sound nice written down on a plaque or something. Make sure it's things that matter, things that are consequential, things that matter for life and death. You need to pray for their salvation. You need to tell them that when all is said and done, my son, all that matters, like the writer of Ecclesiastes said, all that matters is fear God. Nothing else matters. Worship God. Love God. Trust Christ. Put your faith in Him. That's all that matters. You can have all of those things and lose your soul. Tell them a worldview that matters, that matters. Tell them sanctification. Tell them about the Word of God. Tell them the Word of God is inerrant no matter what the world throws at you. Build those things in their lives. As a church, you know what? We want to 
elders of a church that's not tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. That's what kind of church we want Grace Church to be. We want to be a church that's rooted and grounded, a church that plants their feet in these truths because they've been reminded of them so much they're saturated with them. So they're not tossed here and there. That's the reason in 2023, you know what? We're just going to keep reminding you. We'll try to think of some different ways of saying the same thing, but, but that's, our, that's what we do. That's what you need to do. When you sit down and counsel somebody, you just remind them of things they may already know, but they're just not applying at that moment. Things they may have forgotten. Their lives have been so clouded by other things, they've gotten away from the simple truths of God's Word. You confront it with the Word of God. This, this world has all their remedies for things, but we look to the Word of God. Father, thank you for our time today. Thank you, Father, for this reminder to us to remind others. Thank you, God, for giving us a message to remind others to. Thank you for giving us your truth. In Jesus' name, amen.